This face saw immense change throughout the Western world, bringing about the fall of an ancient republic, subduing nations, and planting the seeds which would blossom into the Roman Empire. He is Julius Caesar, and his influence extends down even to the modern day. But in what ways do we recall Caesar today? Do we see him as a brilliant mastermind of martial skill? Do we recognize his ability to lead, his rhetorical prowess, his incredible ability to control and manipulate the world around him to his benefit and that of his progeny? Or do we merely associate him with flash and glamour, as we have co-opted his name and association, correctly and incorrectly in some cases, with various and sundry aspects of our modern capitalistic world, from the gaudy celebration of ancient Rome that is Caesar's palace in Las Vegas and elsewhere, to various, rather innocuous representations of the glory of Rome in video games, both indirectly as a greater ideal of what Rome stood for in terms of engineering, city building, and planning, and directly as a playable character whose diplomatic and martial expertise is left to the interpretation of individual players, to even things as basic as pizza and salad dressing. We think, too, of Caesar's image in conjunction with more sinister aspects of modern history, including the use of the glory of Rome and Caesar as a means to an end for the fascist party and Mussolini's grander designs for the new Rome in the run-up to World War II. All these things combined paint an image of Julius Caesar for modern audiences that is the result of both our collective yearning for a powerful touchstone figure from the ancient world, to whom we can draw parallels to our own experiences, but also because Caesar himself was a master of propaganda, and set himself up to be considered the greatest in all things, especially in marketing and promotion. Much of what we know about Caesar's physical image comes to us from Suetonius, who wrote, Fuisse traditur excelsa statura, colore candido, tertibus membris, ore paulo pleniore, nigris vegetisque oculis. He is said to have been tall of stature, with a fair complexion, shapely limbs, a somewhat full face, and keen black eyes. Divus Julius, chapter 45. Suetonius also tells us that Caesar suffered from morbus comitialis, a sort of falling sickness, which may indicate epilepsy. Certainly Caesar would have controlled this aspect of his image carefully, perhaps as carefully as Suetonius notes he controlled his receding hairline. Quote, he was somewhat over nice in the care of his person, being not only carefully trimmed and shaved, but even having superfluous hair plucked out, as some have charged, while his baldness was a disfigurement which troubled him greatly, since he found that it was often the subject of the jibes of his detractors. Because of it, he used to comb forward his scanty locks from the crown of his head, and of all the honors voted him by the Senate and the people, there was none which he received or made use of more gladly than the privilege of wearing a laurel wreath at all times. Divus Julius, chapter 45. The image of Julius Caesar circulated amongst the widest audience, though, was that which appeared on coinage in the years following his dictatorship and death. James C. Toynbee, in her article on portraits of Julius Caesar, claims that such coinage is basic in the study of his iconography, and even notes that as Caesar's image went from that of real-life military dictator to deified martyr, the features are softened and made more appealing, and that Mark Antony himself had some coinage issued as a sort of propaganda portrait to discredit the tyrannicides as murderers. Of course, neither Suetonius nor simple coinage was Caesar's true means of promotion. Rather, that honor falls to Caesar himself. Through his prolific writings, he painted an image of himself that underscored his accomplishments, while subtly, yet decisively, undermining his detractors. As Ronald Meller notes in his work, The Roman Historians, the purpose of the Gallic War was, of course, political. Caesar did very little in his mature life that was not politically motivated. When we consider Caesar's writings, we find that, in fact, they are rather political in nature in many respects. Take, for example, this portion of the Civil Wars. Quote, when this was known, Caesar addresses his troops. He relates all the wrongs that his enemies had ever done him, and complains that Pompeius had been led astray and corrupted by them through jealousy and a desire to detract from his credit, though he had himself always supported and aided his honor and dignity. He complains that a new precedent had been introduced into the state, whereby the right of tribunitial intervention, which in earlier years had been restored by arms, was now being branded with ignominy and crushed by arms. Civil Wars, Chapter 7. 
Caesar here has no issue with undermining Pompey by accusing him of being led astray, which alternatively serves Caesar's purpose of justifying his actions to the Senate, while also making a commentary on the situation in Rome, specifically with the curbing of the power of the tribunes, and selling himself as being above the fray when it comes to the political problems of the day. Such deft salesmanship certainly paints a picture of the Caesar brand. How, then, does this apply to the modern day? When we fast forward to millennia, we find a world whose image of Caesar is alternatively historical and quasi-mythical. This should be no surprise, for even Caesar's family, the Julians, employed mythology for their own self-promotion, as was de rigueur at the time. As David Johnson notes in Narcissism and Echoes, using myth and advertising, the Julian clan, among whom Julius Caesar is probably the most famous member, derives its name from Iulus, the son of the mythical figure of Aeneas, the legendary founder of the Roman race. The Julian clan, therefore, not only derives fame from having such a famous connection to Rome's legendary past, but also gains an almost divine right to rule, as their having been set up as descendants of the father of their race. We find Caesar's image in various places. Occasionally the depiction is generally speaking appropriate, as that of Caesar in the Firaxis Civilization series, where Caesar represents the Romans in just about every iteration of the game. Occasionally, though, the image is so far off base as to be comical in nature, such as that of Little Caesar's, the pizza chain, though it is interesting to note that at least this version of Caesar sports the laurel leaves Suetonius mentioned as being one of Caesar's fondest accoutrements. The use of Caesar's image in Caesar's Palace, a chain of hotels and casinos originally founded in 1966 in Las Vegas and since spread throughout the country as part of the Harris Casino Group, is more appropriately that of his adoptive son and heir, Caesar Augustus. However, an informal and generally unscientific survey of visitors conducted during a recent visit to Las Vegas indicates that most visitors are unaware of the difference between Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus. However, when quizzed on whether they are more familiar with Julius Caesar or Augustus, approximately 77% of the respondents, or 23 out of 30, named Julius, though of these, 17 or 57% of the total believe that Julius was the quote-unquote first emperor of Rome. Another inappropriate use of the image of Caesar is in connection with Caesar's salad dressings. While the name is conveniently associated with the Roman statesman, the salad has nothing to do with Rome. It is named instead for Cesare Cardini, who is credited with inventing the salad in Tijuana during the Prohibition era. One of the more insidious uses of Caesar's image is how he was co-opted into service by Benito Mussolini, leader of fascist Italy from the mid-1920s until his death in 1945. While most would associate Mussolini's plans for Italy with a rebuilding of the Roman Empire, Jan Nellis notes in Constructing Fascist Identity, Benito Mussolini and the Myth of Romanità, regarding the opening of the Mostra Augustea della Romanità, a grand spectacle for the benefit of connecting the fascist regime with the ancients. The Augustan exposition was nothing more than art and antiquity at the service of propaganda. Fascism had conquered its empire. The fascist engine had to be kept going. Augustus was the fuel. Augustus, however, never played a very significant role in Mussolini's vision of classical antiquity. If we consider his writings, it is not Augustus, but Julius Caesar, who is mentioned over and over as an exemplum and a forerunner of fascist activism. Mussolini himself said of Caesar, quote, The murder of Caesar was a disgrace for humanity. I love Caesar. He was the only one who united in himself the will of the warrior and the genius of the wise man. In the end he was a philosopher who contemplated everything sub specie eternitatis. Yes, he loved glory, but his pride didn't divide him from humanity." End quote. Caesar's own propaganda machine, that is to say himself, could not have imagined a more glorious description. However, would Caesar have appreciated being connected with such a repressive regime as that promulgated by Mussolini? Perhaps so. Perhaps not. However, one thing is for sure. The image and ideal of Caesar played into Mussolini's desire to connect his Italy to Caesar's Italy across the expanse of time. That, then, is perhaps Caesar's most enduring legacy, not the random use of his image, but rather the development of the monomyth legend that is the larger-than-life figure of Julius Caesar. He is not so much solely an advertising touchstone as he is a personage whose exploits and deeds speak to a larger sense of human need, the need for heroes or for strong leaders, even if those individuals must paint their own pictures for history's sake. That, then, is perhaps how Julius Caesar is most reflected in the modern world, as a man whose image is exactly as he would have wanted it, strong, controlled, generally positive, and influential. Isn't that what we all want from history? <laughs>